Like I mentioned in my last video, there is a secret in Inscription that has been hidden in the game for months. And the reason it hasn't been found yet is because it's exclusive to the console version of the game. And for the past few months, the Inscription community has been putting their heads together trying to figure out what this secret is. And after all this time, it's finally been solved. And so, in this video, I wanted to break down the puzzles and walk through everything in the Inscription console ARG. And I'll start with a quick recap of my last video to get everyone up to speed on how this all started. So as a frame of reference, Inscription was released on console in August 2022 for the PS4 and PS5. And this was when this secret was first introduced. However, for whatever reason, it remained completely hidden until it was mentioned by Daniel Mullins in an interview in November 2022, where he was asked if there was anything left in Inscription that hadn't been found yet. Normally, my answer for this is always no, but I will say, because it still hasn't been found, there is something that's unique to the console versions. But even though the community knew there was something there, it still took months to figure out where to even begin hunting for this secret, and it wasn't until February of 2023 that something suspicious was discovered during the Archivist fight in Act 3. So the Archivist fight works a bit different on console. Unlike the PC version, the Archivist on console doesn't use files from your own hard drive. Instead, Luke Carter's hard drive is used, and on it there are some easter eggs, fan art, and all of Luke's other files. But tucked away in his screenshots folder, there's this image called seemsimportant.png. And if you select it, it'll display it on P3's face. And it's a little hard to see, but it shows a dialogue box from the woodcarver with a bunch of X's separated into three sections. And this should look familiar if you're aware of any of the other Daniel Mullins ARGs or secret hunts that have happened in the past. This group of X's is a cipher, and we can use it to decode something that's encrypted. The only issue is that we need to find where to use it first. Luckily, there's only one place in the console version of Inscription where you can type in text, and that's when you're naming your death card during Act 1. And you can only use a maximum of 16 characters for a death card name, which is conveniently the exact length of this cipher that was found. So if you put this cipher in as the name of your death card, the screen will glitch out, the card name will change, and the stats change to a 03 with no sigils. And in addition to this, after you put this code in, certain NPCs will have additional dialogue for you. Goobert in Act 1, the Pike Mage in Act 2, and the Mycologist in Act 2 will all have new dialogue that's totally scrambled and completely unreadable. So what this tells us is that we're attempting to decode this dialogue from these NPCs by putting in that code at the death card. And clearly, all these X's are not the correct code. So we're going to need to replace these X's with something else. And that, for the most part, was where the community was when I made my last video a couple weeks ago. We knew we needed to replace these X's, we just weren't sure what to replace them with. But since then, there's been a ton of collaboration between the Inscription community, and this whole hunt has been solved. So, let's figure out what to replace these X's with. Our cipher is divided up into three sections, which indicates that there are three separate puzzles we need to find, and those puzzles will tell us what to replace these X's with. Unfortunately though, there were no hints as to where these puzzles might be, so the community was scouring over every corner of the game trying to find these puzzles, but nothing was found for a while. That was until Daniel Mullins gave a very helpful hint. He mentioned that some of the puzzles use features that are exclusive to the PlayStation version of the game. And looking into it a little, the only exclusive PlayStation features are ones involving the controller. The light bar, the speaker, and the haptics on the controller are all used to enhance the inscription experience on PlayStation. And it looks like they were also used to hide some secrets. And sure enough, a little after this hint was given, the community found that if you stand next to the flickering box in P3's factory in Act 3, the controller lights will also begin to flicker on and off in a repeating pattern. And what was interesting about this was that the controller flickering didn't match the lights coming from the box. So if we translate this light pattern using Morse code, it comes out to say James, which fits in either the first or third section of our cipher. But since this was found in Act 3, the community placed James in the third section and theorized that the other two puzzles were in Act 1 and Act 2. And so, with a little more searching, it was quickly found in Act 1 that there's another Morse code message that can be decoded in a very specific spot in the game. In the final moments of Act 1, after you grab the camera from Leshy and take a picture of him, if you stand in the far right corner and face the new game card, 
Your controller will begin to vibrate and repeat a message in Morse code, which when decoded comes out to say parts, which is five characters long. So we can put parts in our first section, and that just leaves us with the puzzle in Act 2. And this one took the longest to find out of all of them, mainly because it was just really easy to miss. It was hidden within P3's boss fight. At some point in this fight, P3 will play the Melter card, and if you damage the Melter card, the speaker on the PlayStation controller will play this audio. Pain. The audio is a little hard to hear, but it says pain. I'll explain later why the Melter card reacts this way, but for now, we have the final piece of our puzzle with pain. And so with a completed cipher of parts, pain, James, the community quickly found that when you put it in at the death card, it decodes into James Cobb. Now, this is a completely new name that doesn't really lead us anywhere at the moment, but we at least know this is decoded correctly because it's not just gibberish. And this should mean that the dialogue from the other NPCs has also been decoded. And sure enough, in Act 1, if we have our newly created James Cobb death card in our deck, and we go talk to Goobert, he'll say this. That death card. In your deck. Painful memories. His trial? Quite unusual. Parts of his body. Morphed. Transformed. Even stranger? He enjoyed it. But the master could not allow that. So Goobert clearly recognizes this James Cobb in our deck. Apparently they were once a follower of Magnificence who went a little too far. They were morphing and transforming into something else, and Magnificus was not okay with that and threw them out. And that's all we get from Goobert. But maybe we'll learn more from the other NPCs. And heading over to the Pike Mage in Act 2, she'll now say to us, To soothe the pain, I imagine how things could be worse. Like that mage who came before me. A ruby mage like me. But Magnificus got rid of him. He even got the blue man involved. The deal was that the master has to find someone with a use for the poor sap. Making NPCs isn't cheap and all that. The name's Amber, by the way. Now, back to my meditations. So this expands a little more on the story we heard from Goobert earlier. James Cobb was a ruby mage until Magnificus removed him. But we learned some additional info here. Mainly that the blue man was involved with removing James Cobb. And this is referring to Irving, the AI assistant for Gameworks from another Daniel Mullins game, The Hex. Irving was also involved in the development of Inscription too, but here we find that he had struck a deal with Magnificus. If Magnificus could find someone else who would take James Cobb in, then Irving would happily create another NPC to replace James Cobb. So it looks like Magnificus did find someone that had a use for James Cobb because he now has the Pike Mage instead. And her name's Amber, by the way. This isn't really super important to the story, but it's cool that we finally know her name. But who did Magnificus find that had a use for James Cobb? Well, maybe we'll find out at our last NPC, the Mycologist. If we talk to them, they'll say, James Cobb? We, we, we operated on him. Oh, oh no. The scanner doesn't do flesh, so we worked on him. But he volunteered? 25% bot. 54% bot. 75%. Hmm. That's when he started to get crazy. So it looks like P3 was the one who took James Cobb in. But P3's scanner wouldn't accept James Cobb's flesh, so the mycologist kept operating on James and transformed him piece by piece into a bot. And when James's body was 75% bot, his mind began to decay and he started going mad. And that's all we know at the moment. These three NPCs have all shed a little bit of light on who this James Cobb is. But while I was reading, you probably also noticed that there were certain characters surrounded by parentheses in their dialogue. If we pull all of these out, we get eight characters. Unfortunately, these eight characters don't really get us anywhere at the moment. If you put them through different cipher decoders, it really doesn't come up with anything useful. So maybe there's just something we're missing, something we've been overlooking. So let's go back to the death card. There's one element that's been overlooked across all this. The stats on the card. Every time the James Cobb death card is created, it becomes a zero attack, three health card with no sigils. This had to mean something. So the community did some investigating, and eventually this led to the card creation sequence in Act 3. If you create a zero attack, three health card, with no sigils using P3's scanner, once you get up from the table, a message will display on the terminal next to the scanner. This message is a log entry from P3, and it says, Log 27.3. My OP card creation continues. Reached 75% bot. Still wasn't scanning, so he put his head in the melter. 
popped a new head on top. I thought I was lagging when I saw what happened next. Not killed. Still had his memories? His soul? Asked him his name and he shot a pattern into my factory floor. So it looks like even at 75% bot, P3 scanner was still not able to scan James Cobb into a card. So P3 did what anybody would do and ripped James's head clean off, tossed it in the melter, and slapped a gun on top instead. And this explains why that audio came from the melter earlier. It was actually James Cobb's head, which is somehow still alive. It even explains why the melter turns into a meat bot when defeated. It's James's head. But somehow, even though his head had been removed, James's body still retained its memories. And when P3 asked for his name, he shot it into the factory floor. And we'll come back to that shortly, but you probably also noticed, again, that there were some more letters in parentheses. And pulling these out gives us Y-E-K, which brings us to a total of 11 characters. And you know what else is 11 characters long? YouTube video IDs. So if you go to that specific video on YouTube, you'll find the video question mark question mark dash question mark question mark by GW Archive Private. And you'll immediately see the words Plasma Jimmy on the floor. And this must be that pattern that James Cobb shot into P3's floor. And so with this, we find out that James Cobb is now going by the name of Plasma Jimmy. And in case you don't remember, Plasma Jimmy was a card you could get in Act 2. It was this goofy little gun guy that let you spend energy to shoot cards across from it. But the rest of this video just plays the credits to Inscription, with the song Waiting for a Train by Jimmy Rogers playing. Which I can't play because I'll get copyright claimed. But with the credits rolling, this marks the end of this secret hunt and the end of James Cobb's story. He was once a follower of Magnificus, but after being kicked out and having his head replaced with a gun, he now serves P3 as Plasma Jimmy. And who knows, maybe we'll see Plasma Jimmy again in a future game somewhere down the line. Either way, I had a ton of fun putting this all together, and I hope you found it as interesting as I did. But that'll be it from me for now. I should be making some more videos in the future, like maybe finally getting the Hex ARG video done. I'll also be streaming and playing a bunch of different games on my other channel, Flim Bonds. I'm a lot more active on that channel, so if streams sound interesting to you, you should check that out. But again, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next one.